If they wanted to undermine the religion of any country, they needed to attach atrocities, inequalities, etc. to it, and so they attached Vadna to caste. During the period in which this became entrenched, and that period actually goes a long way back, it goes back into probably 1400 years ago when the first Turkish invasions came, which clearly established that those Brahmins and Kshatriyas who resisted the onslaught of the Islamists from Turkey, they refused to change their religion. There were a number of options. Some were the common options of beheading and killing, but there was also another option, which was to break their spirit. What William Wilberforce did then, is with the church, from every church pulpit up and down the country, they started to preach, Hindus are evil people. They have this terrible caste system. They kill their daughters. They burn widows. The actual creation of the first anti-Hindu hate campaign was led by William Wilberforce and supported by the church. We have more people attending Mondays than they have people attending churches at present. And so there is a sense that power structures are beginning to fray and crack and crumble. And what's the natural consequence? The natural consequence is pushback. I'm fairly confident that we are going to see a spike in hate speech against Hindus right the way through until probably the end of 2024. Certainly it's going to increase Hindu phobia, anti-Hinduism is going to increase all the way until 2024. The treasure house is so vast, where does one start? You know, if we put it into the context of at least 5,000 years, of continuous peaceful civilization in a climatic zone of the earth which was protected from the north and from the south fertile food aplenty suddenly you have a little cocooned area in which human beings can explore every aspect of this creation that we find ourselves in and that's what they did not only did they explore every aspect of the external creation but they turned their attention to what it is that was doing the exploring. And this is the biggest source of all of Bharat's immense achievements. You know, we, we loved human beings. We were never trapped in ideologies. We never gave, gave ideologies any great importance unless they enhanced the experience of Anand. Compare and contrast that with the rule of ideologies at the moment. You know, we have ideologies which clearly give rise to suffering and yet they're protected and they're revered a complete reversal of the way in which we have evolved I think if we can convince the world of the simple thought that ideas are not particularly important there is something to be experienced when ideas evaporate and disappear that would be our greatest gift Caste is a concept, whereas Vadna is an observation of the reality within which we live. If you apply Vadna, what we would be doing is looking at the aptitude of every child born in Bharat to understand what their natural skill set was, and then to try and find a way in which we could literally maximize and develop them. So in a Brahmin house somewhere there is a child who is naturally an artist and will hate to study. We need to be able to identify that child and guide them to the appropriate profession. Equally, in households which are traditionally labelled, mislabeled from my perspective as Dalit or whatever, there are youngsters who are being born who will have the intellectual capacities to be the next astrophysicist. We need to be able to find them and develop them and have them contribute and derive benefit from it. That's Varna Vivastha in action. On the contrary, if you look at the way in which Europe is working right now, we can see a caste system at play. We have just had a new king in the United Kingdom. He has inherited that role, hereditary, hierarchical and endogamous in that they seek to marry within the royal families. He has just now announced his deputies and his deputies are his sister, and his brother, neither of whom have a huge reputation for being wonderful at fulfilling that particular role. And so this is a caste system and the population is by and large now beginning to say we don't like this, this doesn't feel right to us, you know why can't we have an elected 
person who is the head of the state? Why do we have to put up with people such as Prince Andrew, and I use his name being fully aware of the consequences of doing so, why is he still a member of the royal family? Why can he not be removed? So these questions are being asked, and that is always the way with a caste system. Because of the built-in inequality, the population at some time or other starts to say no, we will not have this. And that's the biggest difference between caste and body. So the classic response is that the solution to avidya is vidya. And taking that as the compass and using it to guide the research I've done, what I've managed to do is comfortably and reliably firstly de-link the idea that caste as a system is enshrined in Shastra. It is not. That was one of the linkages that the missionaries really sought to establish. If they wanted to undermine the religion of any country, they needed to attach atrocities, inequalities, etc. to it. And so they attached Vadna to caste. And the first thing is we can de-link it. When you've de-linked it, you then look at the history of what actually happened during the period in which this became entrenched. And that period actually goes a long way back. It goes back into probably 1400 years ago when the first Turkish invasions came. I've uh, uncovered records, for an example, which clearly established that those Brahmins and Kshatriyas who resisted the onslaught of the Islamists from Turkey, they refused to change their religion. There were a number of options. Some were the common options of beheading and killing, but there was also another option, which was to break their spirit. And so they were actually denied access to resources. They were imprisoned in compounds on the periphery of villages and towns. They were refused access to resources such as water and so on and so forth. And being Brahmins and Kshatriyas, being persons who were devoted to the service and the protection of Gomadas, they were then forced into dealing and trading and finding a livelihood out of the tanning business. Nothing could have been dirtier and uh, as horrific for them. And that was intended to break their spirit. And I have the records which show that this is what happened. Add that to a second wave of violence. When the British came, they introduced the 1871 Criminal Tribes Act. And in that act, they designated certain tribes who they wished to obliterate as being born criminals. And the act is horrific reading. <laughs> There are people who are born to be criminals, they will remain criminals, their children will be criminals. It's very much similar to the idea of sinners at birth. These were criminals at birth. And again, the British did exactly what the Islamists had done prior to their arrival. Any identity which was resisting their onslaught, refusing to convert, etc., would be designated a criminal tribe. And the records that I found at the time of 1947 when the British departed, there were over 13 million individuals who were members of designated criminal tribes who were living on the periphery of towns and villages, unable to conduct any activity which would elevate their social status. Probably in 1812, the summer of 1812, and this is a period of history that's really worth having a, a closer look at. The British have made a reputation for themselves as being the people who legislated slavery out of existence. That William Wilberforce was the one who pressed to have slavery removed from the whole of the British Empire. And he's held in high esteem. And so I thought I'll have a, a look at exactly what happened. At that time in 1812, there was a movement to change the charter of the East India Company. The East India Company had been making a lot of money for a long period of time and its scam, its extortion and its exploitation was actually generating great revenues for them and they didn't want the church to have anything to do with upsetting their slave population, which is what we were. But William Wilberforce, on the instructions of the church, he then decided to lobby Parliament to allow the church to send missionaries to change the very nature and fabric of Indian society. Parliament said no. What William Wilberforce did then is with the church, from every church pulpit up and down the country, they started to preach, Hindus are evil people. They have this terrible caste system. They kill their daughters. 
They burn widows. The actual creation of the first anti-Hindu hate campaign was led by William Wilberforce and supported by the church. In 1812, what he managed to do was to get 450,000 signatures on petitions lobbying parliamentarians to allow the church into India to save these terrible heathens. These British subjects, they needed to be saved. There were 900 petitions submitted to Parliament at that time and in the history of the British Parliament there have never been so many petitions on any subject throughout history even to the modern date. This is why the word caste is known to everybody in every corner of the Euro-Christian Empire. You can go into a tiny village in the remotest parts of deep South Georgia and the white Christian person will have heard of the Hindu caste system. And this is the origin of that seeding. It's also worth noting that the person who got rid of slavery, he also arranged in 1833, in fact he died three or four days after the legislation passed, but he, or he was also the person who arranged for a payment of 20 million pounds to slave owners, not to the people who had been enslaved. When the legislation was passed, the ruling elites in Britain they thought we have lost an asset. All of these slaves we owned, now we don't have them. That's a loss to us. And so they arranged for a payment from the public purse of 20 million pounds. And this payment was actually paid by the British people and only ended in 2015. So this whole notion of having gotten rid of slavery, we see in a different light. Now this was the person who then arranged for the church to come into India. In the renewal period of 1813, the church managed to get a clause inserted into the charter of the British East India Company, which allowed them to proselytize and perform evangelical missions here in Bharat. And when you consider, from 1813 to 1857 was not very long, and that was the period it took for the missionaries of the Church of England to so disrupt Hindu society that Hindu society did what the um, East India Company knew it would do, it rebelled. It said, no, you're trying to destroy the fundamental fabric of who we are, and this is one step too far. The Hindu identity has never been under as much assault as it is now. You know, we had a time when the Hindu identity was localized in this nation, and the atrocities that were perpetrated against us are only now beginning to be spoken about never mind dealt with. One of the aspects though which happened was that the Hindu identity was exported by slavers. They took Hindus to different parts of the world and we took our culture and our identity with us. In the United Kingdom after the Second World War there was such a dearth of manpower they needed to rebuild the nation and so Hindus were welcomed. And frankly speaking Hindus are a wonderful slave population. We're appreciated wherever we go but if you have a look, very rarely are we respected. Respect is given amongst equals, appreciation is given to those who you derive benefit from. And what we're now seeing is that the Hindu community has become established in so many places around the globe. It's a minority, it's often touted as a model minority, and we are moving from being appreciated towards being respected. And there are two areas where we're now impacting and beginning to exert influence. One is the political life of these nations, but the other one is the religious life of these nations. Now those two together are actually the fabric of these societies. And now that we're seeing Hindus appearing in Parliament, we have a Hindu Prime Minister, suddenly those elites who have built their power structures around the world on religious identities, on political power, are seeing something which possibly threatens their validity. In the United Kingdom we have, I think, over 3,200 yoga practitioners who are white, Christian origin, indigenous natives, and yet they have abandoned their traditional religious allegiances. Only last year there was a survey done of British churches, and in one weekend, on one Sunday, nationally, only 720,000 people attended church. We have more people attending Mondays than they have people attending churches at present. 
And so there is a sense that power structures are beginning to fray and crack and crumble. And what's the natural consequence? The natural consequence is pushback. So we're going to see, I'm fairly confident that we are going to see a spike in hate speech against Hindus right the way through until probably the end of 2024. Certainly it's going to increase. Hindu phobia, anti-Hinduism is going to increase all the way until 2024. And then I hope that will be peak hatred, as I call it. And after that, things will return to a much healthier state. But Hindus should prepare for a, uh, should prepare for a tortuous and tumultuous ride over the next couple of years, whether it's within Bharat or outside of Bharat.